I had a minor mishap the other day. I was having two hours fishing. Suddenly got a bite when I wasn't watching my rod. I turned around so fast, my spectacles flew off my face and sank in the lake. Paula suggested claiming on the insurance, but it seemed such a lame excuse for losing something I didn't fancy putting it on the claim for. I was obviously not wearing those glasses correctly, and in any event, if I filled out a form every time I had a mishap, I'd end up with writer's cramp. Some people are less fussy though, and will make excuses to insurance companies which are so lame they should be confined to wheelchairs. Here's a few genuine examples made to motor insurers. In my attempt to kill a fly, I drove into a telegraph pole. <laughs> well, if that don't kill it, nothing will. An invisible car came out of nowhere, struck my car and vanished. Now, I suppose that could happen to anyone, just not on this planet. The guy was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. And I thought my window was down, but I found out it was up when I put my head through it. I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law and headed over the embankment. I had been driving for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident. And finally, not so much an excuse, more of a sorry tale. I saw a slow-moving, sad-faced old gentleman as he bounced off the roof of my car. Anyhow, you get the drift. Lame excuses. There's actually a parable of the lame excuses in the Bible, although some people know it as the parable of the great banquet. I'll read it to you. Luke 14 16 to 24. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out please excuse me still another said I just got married so I can't come the servant came back and reported this to his master then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor the crippled the blind and the lame sir the servant said what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. So there you go. Lame excuses. I've got to look at a field. I bought some new oxen. It's date night with a missus. It's the ancient equivalent of the dog ate my homework, isn't it? But I suppose I should start by giving a little background information about this story. It really starts out referencing the rejection of Christ by Israel. The banquet is a metaphor alluding to the kingdom of God and Christ invites these people to join him there. Israel is represented by the invited guests who don't come. In the custom of the time, there were always two invitations to a banquet. The first would be made well in advance. Those who accepted would be given a second invitation immediately prior to the event. And there was a reason for this. The host would need to know up front how many animals would need to be killed for the feast and how much other food would be required. That's why he wanted to see how many would attend in advance. The second invite was just to tell the, the guests that the time was now and to come straight away. In that culture, it would be almost unthinkable for someone to accept the first invite 
and then not respond to the second. It would have been seen as worse than terribly rude, more of a deliberate slight. For a number of people to do it at the same event, it would be viewed as a conspiracy to humiliate the host. And so it was. The original invitation to the great spiritual banquet was made hundreds of years in advance, perhaps most obviously and most clearly by the nation's favourite prophet, Isaiah. But the Old Testament in general is shot through with references to the coming Messiah. And just like those who had that first invite in the parable, the Jews knew something big was going to happen, even if they couldn't pin down the exact moment. But come that moment, they want nothing to do with the Messiah. Why not? Well, one reason might be that Jesus wasn't what they were hoping for. And yet I know that Isaiah graphically describes the coming king as the suffering servant, the one who will die in the place of sinners. But people will sometimes believe what they want to believe, won't they? Human beings are masters of self-deception. And in those hundreds of years since Isaiah prophesied, that suffering servant had been replaced by the Messiah of popular mythology in the minds of the people. It had been downgraded from the creator God who would rescue his people from the consequences of sin to a sort of comic book superhero who kicked the Romans out of Jerusalem. Sad but true. And in the parable, as in real life, they don't answer the call. They've got better things to do despite their response to the first invitation. It's not all bad news though, is it? even if there is a tragic outcome for those initially invited. Verses 21 and 22, the servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. So, okay. The religious bigwigs have utterly rejected their Messiah. They prefer to wait for the comic book caped crusader to turn up. He never has, of course. 2,000 years and they're still waiting. Generations of them live and die and then they stand in front of the one they rejected, the one they judged, to be judged themselves. It really is tragic. But it isn't tragic for those who take their place at Christ's banquet, is it? The poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. They're elevated by Jesus beyond what they could ever imagine. The master sends his servants to the ordinary people to bring them in. It's what we call evangelism. His servant is instructed to tell them to come to the kingdom. But it seems from the text that the servant has already done this, even before he was given the order. The master commands him to draw these people in, and the servant says, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Puts me in mind of John 15, 15. Jesus, talking to his disciples, says, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. And this servant apparently knew his master's business. It was to bring people to the kingdom of God. Yet the master wants to give everyone the opportunity. Go out into the roads and country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. And we can see this as God including the Gentiles in the kingdom, you and me. More about that later, but I want to take you to a very similar parable in Matthew 22, verses 1 to 14. It says this, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent more servants and said, 
Tell those who have been invited that I prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything's ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burnt their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you can find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are invited, but few are chosen. <coughs> Excuse me. Similar idea, though this time it's a wedding banquet for the king. They've had their first invite, which they've obviously accepted. The fattened cattle have been slaughtered and everything's ready. But no, they're not going. Some of them wander off to do stuff. It's lame excuses time again. Others beat and even kill the king's emissaries. And he's had enough. He destroys those people. Destroys them. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, is actually not to be trifled with. He's not the lone dissenting voice in the Godhead when people bring judgment on themselves. And as before, we have evangelism. People are brought into the banquet. But then we get that incident where the guy tips up in the wrong threads. He's not wearing wedding clothes. And gentle Jesus, meek and mild, has him tied hand and foot and thrown out. I wonder, does that seem harsh to you? Just for wearing the wrong gear? Well... It isn't. Matter of fact, that's the only thing Jesus could have done with him. He didn't belong at the banquet. He didn't belong with Christ. And I'm going to tell you why. He wasn't some poor guy who couldn't run to buying a decent suit. In those days, the host provided the wedding clothes for all the guests. He chose not to wear what was freely available and he chose to insult the host by turning up improperly dressed. The wedding clothes given freely by God represent his Holy Spirit. We are clothed with power from on high as Luke puts it, clothed with imperishable and clothed with Christ according to Galatians. The Holy Spirit, given freely to those who believe, is the non-negotiable prerequisite that we bring to God's table. He provides, we just need to receive. So guys, where do we fit in these parables? We're in there somewhere because everybody is. Are we like those lame excuse merchants? who hear the invitation, but ultimately don't go? Are we more like that servant who knew the master's business, sharing the good news with anyone who will listen? Are we people who have eagerly accepted both invitations, been clothed in the Holy Spirit, and even now are sitting down with the king? Hopefully, none of us will be like the guy that was ejected, who chose not to dress appropriately. And I know that a lot of people worry about whether they've received the Holy Spirit or not. I'll clear that up for you. In order to be in Christ, or to 
have our feet under the table at his banquet, if you like. We must be born of the Spirit. In the second chapter of Acts, the Holy Spirit is categorically promised to everyone who believes, repents and, and is baptised. In, in other words, everyone who submits themselves unconditionally in faith to God receives the Holy Spirit. The primary evidence of the indwelling spirit is that he is transformative, that he will change us to be more like Jesus. We will develop more of his character, the fruit of the spirit, if you will. And the outworking of that may include deeper love, more compassion, self-sacrificial giving, the desire to see others come to faith and many, many other things. The Spirit is transformative, but he is also empowering. His power in us is exclusively about equipping us to serve whatever form that service takes. But unsubmitted people who have no intention of serving God by serving others, they're not going to be empowered. Here's the thing. Transformation, in my experience, is generally a process and often a long one. Some things might change immediately. Other things could take years. But don't write yourself off just because you struggle to submit some area of your life to God. He's already changed your heart or you wouldn't be struggling to overcome it, would you? And as long as your primary desire in life is Christ, he will help you get there. Your main contribution will be to allow his spirit to act within you unhindered and to position yourself in his presence as often as possible. In other words, guys, let the man work. May we pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the illumination these parables bring about your determination to save everyone who is willing and about the work of your Holy Spirit essential in that process. Father, give us even greater commitment to you. Help us fully and completely submit to your transformative work. We want to be people who can effectively serve you, to love and to give and to share the gospel in your power. And Lord, bless us with a strong sense of your presence as we seek to walk more closely with you. In Jesus' name, Amen.